This is Join Us in France, episode 240. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is a podcast where you will hear pragmatic advice and new inspiration for your next trip to France. On the podcast, I invite travel enthusiasts to come join me for a conversation about how their trip went, what they loved, and what they wouldn't do again. We try to keep it to one topic, but when you start telling a story, it's hard to know where it's going to go. Join us in France gets support from Patreon supporters, one-time donors, and soon-to-be-released GPS-aware tours. Yes, making progress. More about that after the interview. On today's episode, a trip report with Karen and Scott Solcher about wine touring and cooking classes in Provence. They found some gems, and I think a lot of you might want to try those places too. And these are not affiliate um, re recommendations, just FYI. If you are interested in this episode, I recommend you look into the other episodes we've done about Provence. Go to joinusinfrance.com, then destinations, and then Provence area. And the search button works great too. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 240. <laughs> Bonjour Karen and Scott and welcome to join us in France. Bonjour oh. Annie. Bonjour Annie. Bonjour. Thanks to... for having us on the program. Oh, you are very welcome. I'm very excited to have you to talk about your wine touring and cooking classes in Provence. So tell us where you're from, uh, more or less how you organized your trip, if it was your first time in France. I know you speak French, right? Um, some. Mm. Not great, but uh, enough to get by. Not as much as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's like me in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, yes, we're from Kansas, uh, and we uh, we've been to France several times. Uh, this is this is actually our fourth uh, each. Uh, we've been three times together. We both went as kids, uh, but for this trip, we uh, flew from Kansas actually to Madrid for a day um, to just to go to the Prado. But then we flew to Marseille. Uh, we rented a car in Marseille, uh, drove to Vaison la Romaine. Uh, stayed uh, outside of uh, that town uh, for a wine tour, uh, then drove uh, to the Pont du Gard uh, mm -hmm. to Uzez for two days, to Nîmes for two days, and then back to Marseille where we flew home. Excellent. Wow. And you, this was in, uh, in April 2019? That's correct. And it was just the two of you? Correct. Okay. All right. Okay, so you spent a fair amount of time doing wine touring and cooking classes. So do tell, what did you, where did you go? What did you love? Well, let, I'll, I'll start with the wine touring, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. it, it was at the beginning part of our trip. So it, it we uh, uh, had booked a, a wine tour through La Madeleine, which is the Rhone wine holidays. Uh, and it's a bed and breakfast that's outside of uh, Vaison La Romaine. Uh, Philip Redway and Jude Redway are the um, people that run it. Um, Philip has studied at the Wine and Spirit Educational Trust and uh, is an approved instructor through that institute, so he knows a lot about wine. Oh. We know a lot about wine, uh, we, uh, especially American wine, but this was a great, great experience. So when we drove there for the first evening, we actually had a 60-minute uh, kind of wine briefing, a little lecture. Um, about what to expect the following day, which was very helpful as we uh, tasted the following day. Um, there was another couple that was with us, um, uh, but and then J Jude obviously uh, 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 is a great cook as well, um, and we had dinner that evening too. But the following morning, uh, we started. Uh, uh, we have tasted at four different uh, wineries, mm. and we started at Domaine de Morchon uh, in Segre. Uh, we actually were hosted by the winemaker, and that's one of the things that we got to do with this trip. Uh, Philip worked really hard to establish contacts with uh, winemakers um, yeah. uh, throughout the region. Um, 
So we tasted several wines there. It's a great place. They're, they're good values, by the way, certainly by American standards. Uh, the places we went were uh, good values in wine. Um, by good value, what do you be more specific? Well, so most of the uh, – the so we were in the Cote de Rhone area for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, And, and a, a bottle of those wines are typically probably $15 um, uh, for a very good bottle of wine. Um, in the States, a lot of times, uh, wine's much more expensive than that if it's from Napa or Sonoma or whatnot. So yeah. uh, really good values, by uh, certainly by American standards, I yeah. would think. And I assume that most of the wineries you visited, like Le Domaine de Mourchon that you mentioned uh, in Seguré, they probably have uh, like a range of wines they probably have a you know a basic wine and then it goes up in price they do so we learned a lot about that um uh, the uh, the Cote de Rhone is a is a AOP so that's a uh, appellation d'origine protégée yeah uh, it used to be an AOC and I uh, guess they changed the uh, uh, control a to protégé mm. uh, And then that's the kind of the premier uh, of the wines, if, if it's an AOP wine. There's a lot of rules that go along with that. Yeah. Varietals of grapes are regulated and time in the barrel is regulated, all that sort of thing. Yeah, even, the, even the number of times that the winemaker has to go taste the grapes. I mean, they, they regulate to a ridiculous degree. Uh, that doesn't, might be why they picked, they went from... Uh, origine protégée to no from origine uh, contrôlée to origine protégée because it was possibly making their life a little easier. Yeah, so th that that changed, I guess, six or seven years ago. But mm. there is a, a level below that called IGP, which is Indication Géographique yeah. Protégée, which is not as regulated. Uh, those wines, I, I guess, are generally not as considered as prestigious. They're not as expensive. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the Vin de Table or the Vin de Pays. Yeah. Uh, which has little regulation. Yeah, um, vin de table, vin de pays, it could be anything. I mean, it might tell you it's French grapes, it might tell you it's Spanish grapes or Italian grapes or whatever, but that's all you're going to know. Or it, it could tell you it's grapes wherever we can find them. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so well, there, there's a lot around, it seems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we then tasted at Chateau uh, de la Nert. So that's actually Chateau Neuf de Pop. So that is a more uh, prestigious yeah. and uh, AOP. So obviously, some of the AOPs, uh, Bordeaux, Champagne, um, Burgundy, those those AOPs uh, are, are more prestigious, and those wines were more expensive. Uh, we were hosted by Nadige. Uh, uh, she's not the winemaker, but she did a great job uh, uh, hosting us and telling us about Uh, their wines. We got a tour through their their cellar. I'm not sure everybody uh, should expect that if they taste there, yeah. uh, but they have also a beautiful um, uh, maison that's been there for a long time. Uh, the Germans actually occupied it in the, during World War II, and mm. uh, so all all the vintages before 1944 are gone for <laughs> for, for the much. chateau. Yeah. 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 What you mentioned that uh, you shouldn't expect to vi to to get to visit the the you know the insides uh, the innards of the winery that's very true because typically most of these places will have a, a kind of a showroom where you can taste and you can look at their bo at their bottles they sometimes offer other products they might sell you know local I don't know, jams or local, whatever it is. Um, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily set up to accompany you to visit the rest of the winery. And that's because uh, when, you, um, when you welcome people into your business, there is all of, this is France, everything is regulated. So if you let people in, there's a lot of rules you have to follow all of a sudden. Like you have to have public bathrooms and you have to have, Um, evacuation signs and you have to have, you know, uh, fire extinguishers and things like that. And so some places they just don't want to mess with it. And so they won't ever let you go see the, the back room uh, where the wine is make and uh, where the wine is made, sorry, and other places they will. So it just depends. Right. Yeah, and we were able to do that in at least uh, uh, several of these, and I don't know if that's because uh, Philip had that arranged or maybe because of the rules and regulations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we then did have lunch uh, at, at, in, at Chateau Neuf de Pop itself at a family-run restaurant right underneath the, the, the ruins of the chateau, mm. uh, Vergere de Pop. It was, a, it was 
a, a great lunch. Um, it was a family run restaurant. Um, there were a lot of locals there. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a beef daube there, oh, which yeah. is kind of like beef bourguignon. Yep. It was delicious. But um, with carrots, right? With carrots. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but great food, great value. Um, all the seasonal ingredients. When we were there, asparagus was in season, strawberries were in season, and we had that at several meals. But it was just yeah. unlike what we can get here. Yeah, just amazing. That's great. And I want to point out to everybody listening that I will put your guest notes on the website. So you've sent me very detailed guest notes with all the names written out and all of that, and you will be able to see that. So if you want to follow in their footsteps or go visit a specific place that's been mentioned today, you'll be able to find it fairly easily if you go to joinusinfrance.com and just look for uh, the episode about... uh, wine touring and um, cooking classes in Provence. Excellent. We, we then went after lunch to the Domaine de Christia, which is in Corthezon, uh, and, and hosted by Emmanuel Brunier, who actually was the cousin of the two winemakers. Um, that was one of those places that was just a showroom, but it was very informative, uh, also great wines. They, and they have a wide range of wines there, too. Mm-hmm. And obviously now we're after that, we moved on to our fourth tasting, which was quite extensive. So it was very nice at this point that Philip was doing the driving. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is your fourth tasting fourth, fourth of the day. <laughs> oh, yes, and, and we started at 9.30 in the morning. So wow. it, it was a very, very um, <laughs> aggressive itinerary, I guess yes. you could say. Yes. And, and certainly uh, you, that when we taste, you don't have to drink. You can taste and not drink. Sure. Um, but uh, the but last what's the one fun was, of that? Right. <laughs> By the end, uh, we kind of needed to. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, but uh, St. Jean de Barou in Ventoux was our, our last stop, and we were hosted by the winemaker himself, Philip uh, Jumel, uh, who was very enthusiastic about his wines and kind of made his wines a little bit uh, a little bit outside the box compared to a lot of the other uh, wines of the region, but fascinating to listen to him. Um, and he had a wide range of wines as well. Uh. Yeah, we had several tastings there. He's very excited about his uh, wines and very energetic. He was just um, very interesting to to listen to. Yeah, so, winemakers me. usually are. Could they could they all speak good English? Yes. Yes, the English was good across the board. Um, uh, in in the first one, uh, the, the winemaker is Walter McKinley, uh, who is a uh, an expat. British expat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, McKinley. That doesn't sound very French, <laughs> or Walter, <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> right, right. That's great. So, so that was kind of my favorite part of our trip. That wine. That was the, the wine tasting for for <laughs> just a one day full of wine tasting. Right, and, 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 and the, the, the Rhone Wine Holidays does offer, uh, they have Northern Rhone t- uh, wine tours, they have longer tours, uh, we just had the one day. One right, day. right. They also have some food and wine tours, um, wine and truffle tours, so their website's uh, really nice and easy to maneuver, and I think Philip works with some other uh, touring companies to, to like to go into Burgundy um, area mm-hmm. uh, to make a more comprehensive tour. Um, It's not that he does all of the tour and goes up that far, but um, works with other people that have bed and breakfasts as well. That's great. Now I have to say that this is this Americans and visitors from abroad typically like to arrange these visits, but French people, this is not how we operate. We, I mean, unless we know uh, a place, and it's a place we go to uh, year after year. I have a lot of uh, acquaintances that will go back to the same winery every day to buy, you know, four cases or whatever. And so they 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 just show up one day. We just or if, the way I do it is if, if I'm driving around the countryside, getting somewhere, and I have some time, and I see that there's a winery and a, and it says, you know. Um, wine tasting, I just go <laughs> and I don't, I, you know, I just uh, try things. So, but just trying things doesn't guarantee that you will be going to the best ones or to even ones where they, where they can speak English. I mean, that's the reality is that a lot of winemakers everywhere in France, well, they make, they know how to make wine, but they don't know how to speak English. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. <laughs> yeah, so... 
So, yeah. And we had arranged one other wine tasting that we can talk about uh, later on that we, we had tasted in the United States that we wanted to stop at. Oh, that's fun. That evening, it was just interesting that evening we uh, all went out to dinner in Cresté. And it's funny, it was a small little restaurant, but um, the winemaker from saint jean de Barou was there. Another couple that was tasting there was at the restaurant. So it was a great local place where pretty much everybody was at. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Wow. You can say the French R. The way you said oh, Cresté, you. you said it right. Hey, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, so my favorite part of the trip was, um, Uzez and outside of Uzez for the cooking class. Um, the cooking class was actually, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it was in Alpayag et Auriac, which is a Wait, I guess. commune I'm of sh- Uzez. Um, okay. it's you quite prob- a mouthful. Yeah, but, you um, probably we, wrote uh, it down, right? Let's see. Did you write it down? I did. Oh, Arpayag et Aurillac. Yeah, that's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a commune just right outside of Uzes. Um, and by commune, you don't mean like, you, you mean the French way, in commune. The French way, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not the commune like where they all live like communists or whatever. Uh, no, no. 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 <laughs> That's what they called it. So um, yeah, that's... yeah. C'est une commune in French. Une commune just means a village or a city, and it has the advantage of it doesn't say anything about the size. So commune okay. could be you know five million, or it could be five hundred. It, it doesn't matter. It, it was quite small. Um, uh-huh. I think there was a museum there, and then the cooking class, and I think that's probably about it. Wow. But um, we booked uh, our cooking class uh, online through Cooking with Class. Um, Chef Eric Frodo and his wife Yutunde Oshodi Frodo were our hosts there. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, we took the French bistro cooking class, um, which was a three course menu that we prepared on site. Um, Chef had started. A couple of things ahead of time, but and we didn't do any shopping prior to this trip. You can take cooking classes where you have the market tour. Sure. You see what's available, and then you buy what's fresh and beautiful, and then and then go prepare it. Um, our course was um, scheduled to be about four hours. Mm-hmm. Um, we made pita bread from yeah. scratch, uh, white bean hummus with a parsley oil sauce. Mm. Uh, We made black olive gnocchi with a green olive sauce. Mm. We made a lamb tenderloin, which we had to kind of break down the lamb a little bit Mm. um, with spring vegetables. And the pièce de résistance was our apple tart for dessert. We uh, had to, we made the crust and then we made a compote for on top of the crust, and then we sliced the apples very thin, cooked them a little bit, and formed the apples into rosettes. Yeah. And then made a bouquet of roses on top of the tart. Ooh, very nice. So that's like more of a traditional, traditional yet homemade kind yes. of tart. Yes. Yes, it was very, very pretty. Yeah. And then we would, we would make a dish and then sit to eat at a table near the kitchen and then we'd finish that and then we'd go back to cooking and uh, just <laughs> kind of up and down and uh we were the only americans there uh-huh. um the class was bilingual okay uh, there were three other french people there one was um the pompier fr- from uzez oh nice <laughs> <laughs> that means uh, the so fireman was... for people who don't yeah. who didn't <laughs> that was fun yeah and then uh, the other couple, she was a winemaker. Um, they were quite young, mm-hmm. and she had purchased the class for her boyfriend, husband, uh-huh. um, for his birthday. Um, uh-huh. She at, well, um, she wanted him to start cooking a little bit. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and um, his mother was from Great Britain, and um, his father was French, and he lived his whole life in French, but he 
uh, of course, spoke wonderful English and did a lot of the translating for for us. But um, nice. but Chef speaks very good English. Chef as well. speaks good English, and uh, Yutundi speaks wonderful English as well. Um, so there was wine tasting along with that, local wines um, with our courses. Yeah, um, they offer. They also have a school in Paris, um, so they can offer. They have a bread master's class. Um, uh, they have a fish class, desserts class. They even have some um, cooking with your kids classes. Wow. In Uzes, they offer a week-long culinary vacation, which I thought looked exciting. Um, we might do that again someday. But mm-hmm. it, really, it, 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 it was uh, sophisticated cooking techniques, really. It was, uh, it's, it was stuff that I wasn't certainly familiar with, and we, we do cook some. Um, yeah. and it was, it was certainly much more sophisticated than the norm, at right. least here in the States. Right. A well, lot of knife skills and things like that. Right. And so one of the reasons why I kind of figured it would be, a you know, a more technical course is if you go to the, if you take a class where you go to the market first thing in the morning, it's wonderful, but, uh, whoever is in the class is going to make some choices and and so the the teacher doesn't get to do to direct you quite as much because if you pick something that there isn't that much it's not that complicated then you know that's what you do uh, whereas with uh, a course that it's they they've purchased everything they already planned everything out they have specific exercises in mind for you sure so, yeah sure as we after we completed this course, then um, if you go, um, sorry, Yutunde took pictures all along, so she sent us the file of all of our photos of us cooking and. Yeah, you sent some lovely photos. I'll use them to uh, promote the episode, so that'll be great. You'll get to see oh, them. Oh, cool, cool. Um, so she sends that file to you, and then if you register, then you can uh, have access to all of the recipes and all of the recipes for all of Cooking with Class. So oh, wow. we've actually looked online for other recipes that we've prepared here since we've been home um, that were on file in there. In their That's great. Website. Yeah. So, that so, was- so was anything in the cooking class really surprising to you? Not really. We're kind of foodies. Okay. So we- uh, the thing that I guess that surprised me was really the sophistication of some of the cooking techniques. It's just that uh, some of it, uh, you'd have to be planning ahead. It was labor intensive. Yeah. Um, it's real cooking. I mean, it's it's uh, he's a real chef and um, yeah. trained chef. And... and it was timed perfectly. So here, when we cook, we have a little difficulty getting everything timed right sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he kept us on task. Although um, our class, we had to leave at five and a half hours because we had to get to Nîmes, but uh, it was really only supposed to be a four hour class. So, ah, so it, it went a little longer. longer. Yeah, it went longer than planned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Me, yeah. You know, mise en place is the biggest problem for most cooks, unless, right. you know, because uh, it has to come out at the right moment. <laughs> and sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I didn't time this right. Well, right. if it's just at home, it doesn't matter, but. If you're right. having all people over for dinner or something, you do want it to come out at a uh, expected, you know, kind of, uh, what do you call that, interval. <laughs> right, Yeah. right. Yeah, I'm not very good at mise en place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it slows me down, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so, very nice. uh, those were our favorite things. That's great, that's great. It's, so... Th- have you taken cooking classes in the U.S.? Not in the U.S. We have in Italy before. Mm-hmm. So how um, does it compare to what you've done before? This was, a, uh, again, a much more highly technical class than what we took in Italy. Mm, okay. And I would say more fun, too. We had mm-hmm. a lot of fun. It, there was a lot of laughter and jokes and mm-hmm. uh, and, and it was, uh, it was, uh, there weren't very many. It was a small class, so it was, which really made it a lot more fun in a lot of ways, too. Yeah. Yeah, because I've been in cooking classes at places like Williams and Sonoma and whatever, 
mm-hmm. you have 50 people <laughs> you know it's wow. like it's huge yeah. um it's it's not near because i i like that you got to meet a lot of uh, the, the people that were teaching you be it the uh, the winemakers or the sommelier or the the chef it's great that you know you you had actual uh conversations with these people yeah it was really nice and and what about wine because you um scott you said you uh enjoy wine tasting in the u.s as well so how did it compare to your experiences in the u.s well i think they're actually in a lot of ways pretty similar so in the united states we we go to sonoma often or not often but some um, and oftentimes there's a showroom uh, and where they talk about their wines, where you get to taste their wines. Um, sometimes there's a fee to do that in the United States. I, I don't know how common that is in, in, in France to have the fee. And oftentimes you don't get a tour of the winery itself, uh, the wine making areas, unless you've set that up ahead of time. Uh-huh. So I, I think it really is it was pretty, a lot similar. Of pretty, pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what else did you do on this trip? I see you went to Nîmes. We did. Um, we drove to Nîmes. Which is very close to the Pont du Gard and Uzès and all of that. Correct, correct. And uh, we actually uh, rented an apartment there for a couple oh. of days. Um, it was a great apartment right... It was how far uh, from Maison Carré? Um, uh, 200 feet. 200 wow. feet from wow. Maison Carré. Right, I mean, right outside the door, yeah. It's a stone store from the, from the, from the, from the plaza. Yeah, so um, it was a great little apartment. We had a wonderful landlady, Geraldine. She was so sweet. Um, the the name of the apartment is Une Am Anim. Une, an, uh, une Am Anim, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it had a terrace, uh, which was unique. And yeah. uh, she talked about uh, how that was the selling point for when they purchased the apartment. But it had a grill and um, a little kitchen in there. Um there were three flights of stairs to get there. Ah. Um, we packed so very light. We packed very lightly, so it was good. Oh, that's but good. If you pack big suitcases, it could be challenging, and it could be challenging for somebody who's of limited mobility. Yeah. Yeah, no, but um, so that was great that we were close to um, everything. Everything, really. Right, right. You're right in the center of everything, and you probably had a nice view because you were on the third floor. We did. Right. We did. And and everything in Nîmes, the all the old Roman ruins are they're all very close. Um yeah. you can it's it, in the old town is 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 easy to walk around. Yeah, so. Nîmes is a small place. And I really recommend you don't take a car into Nîmes. It's like maddening. <laughs> well we, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. <laughs> yes. And I and GPS did not work in Nîmes. No. Uh, for whatever that's worth. Our GPS worked most places but not Nîmes. Yes. The yes. Parking it ought to be planned ahead, I would yeah, I have relatives near there, and so I've been there a few times, and I always just, oh, it's frustrating. I don't know why I can't figure out that town. It's so small. Why? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We ended up, um, we were on a timeline. We had to be there at a certain time to meet Gerardine, and um, we had trouble finding the parking garage, and then we were rerouted around the city three times, yeah. and, and finally we just dove into a parking garage and called her, and she met us on the steps of the church and then walked us over to, to the apartment. Oh, so, that's nice. Uh, it was very nice. She that's was very, very nice. sweet. Neem was a lot of fun for me. I'm a, I love Roman history. Oh, um, yeah. So with the, with the arena there that's still in wonderful sh- condition and shape and still being used, um, the Jardin uh, de la Fontaine, uh, there's an old ruined temple there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, uh, there's a tower up at the top of the, of the gardens where you get kind of really impressive views of Nîmes if you climb to the very top. Yeah. Um, and you can buy a ticket for all three, uh, which we did. Um, and, you can, and you don't have to wait in line if, if, you, if you have your ticket. You can scan that and just walk in. Um, but we, yeah, we did all of those things and, uh, and you can do those in a, I don't know, just a couple of hours even. Yeah. 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 Nîmes is a small place, but it's very, very nice. Did you go into the, uh, oh, what's the name of that building, the museum, uh, across from Maison Carré? Uh, we did not. Okay. Uh, I haven't been in there either. <laughs> it's supposed to, we, so the couple that, um, we had stayed, uh, there was that, uh, the, um, the La Madeleine when we did the wine tasting, they we saw them in Nîmes just coincidentally, and they oh. had been there, and they they thought that it was a, a great uh, visit. 
Yeah. Right. I've heard it's wonderful. I can't remember the name of the of the architect now. There's probably uh, listeners who are yelling it out. <laughs> um, Basque? No. I think they... I don't, mm. No, he was a British guy. It's a British guy. Oh, okay. Okay. You recognized him when we walked well, by the building. I thought <laughs> he was a French artist, though. No, no, no. It's yeah. a British guy that designed it. I'm pretty oh. sure. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> at the museum, uh, I think they had a... Um, a Pompeii exhibit going on that's going to be going on for a, a long period of time. So if you're going to be traveling to Nîmes in the near future, and um, that's what's that's what's on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, what we liked about, uh, one of the things that we liked about Nîmes was that it is so clean. That is the cleanest city I have ever been to. Hmm, that's um, true that, that you mention it. It is, they keep it nice. It's, the streets were clean. There was no... Um, there were there was no dog poop in the street or you know, anything like that, um, but it was great. Uh, our, our, I think our favorite thing um, in Nîmes was to have dinner at um, the restaurant Vincent Croisard. He's a Michelin starred chef. Um, I don't know that the restaurant is Michelin starred, but it was very very good. We had um, the six course tasting menu there. You could have up to twelve courses, I think, or even more. Oh wow. Uh, but uh, we thought six was a safe choice. <laughs> we, we learned quickly on this trip that ordering the formula menus was really a lot of food. So yeah. we had to kind of pare back a little bit. But um, that was a great experience. It's a really eclectic restaurant. Um, it's quiet. There are very few front of house people. There were three people in front of house and then um chef doing all the tasting it was his choice so he could send you whatever oh, okay. uh, he was making that evening um so See, it was again, a surprise that's that's a kind of a, a gauge of quality because right? because you're letting the chef decide what's best today it, right. you know, it really was very good quality very high quality yeah. very fancy yeah. um the plates were beautiful everything was presented so nicely and the wait staff were fantastic Mm -hmm. um they they were very patient with our lack of (laughs) (laughs) knowledge about what we were eating um and uh with our our french but um we uh i had i the funny story i um i'm older Uh, i turned 48 on this trip what do you mean you're older (laughs) (laughs) well i'm 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 getting to the point where i cannot read Oh, that, yes, yes, of course. So um, I forgot to take my reading glasses with me and Mm -hmm. uh, was having trouble looking at the menu and the wine list. um, And one of the front of house people recognized my struggle and she disappeared for a minute. And then she came back out and brought me her reading glasses to borrow (laughs) for for the duration of the dinner. And uh, it wasn't until we got back home and kind of looked up the restaurant again that we found out that um, it was Madame Quazal who loaned me her glasses. Uh, so it was the chef's th- wife who worked the front. Wife, correct. <laughs> oh, that's great. Glasses. So it's very gracious of her to do that. Uh, I was able to see what I was eating. So. That's great. Yeah, it's a pain. You get, um, I'm, I'm past that age too and uh, yeah i need glasses <laughs> so uh, another thought about the value of the wine so this was a very fancy restaurant and if you were to go to a similar kind of restaurant in the united states it would be a struggle to find a bottle of wine under 60 dollars mm-hmm. under 50 dollars but virtually all of the wines were under 40 euro um, yeah yeah it, it you really have to go looking hard for in France for a wine over 50. It's, it, I mean, right, you, which, you can find it, but it's not normal. Right. Which was it's, again, very different than, than the United States. Yeah. So, so. In France, if you're paying 15, you have a good wine. If you're in a restaurant, you will pay probably for a good bottle, 30, 250 maybe, but that's really pushing it. So, yeah. Hmm. Scott, um, ordered a great bottle and um madame quasar who is the sommelier for the restaurant um i think gave you props for your we choice props for that. <laughs> ah. yeah, it was a resto uh, so so that was nice so what was the name uh, of the bottle do you remember uh, i don't remember the name of the wine it was over it was a aop rasto though ah okay okay very good yeah 
we have done tasting menus and wine things like this in the United States, and um, the price difference from the U.S. to this experience are, is just incredible. This was a great value. Mm. It was it was expensive, but not nearly as expensive as the experiences we've had on, on stateside with these kinds of Michelin-starred chefs creating these tasting menus. So I'm going to take a, I have no idea how much you paid, but I'm going to take a wild guess that uh, without the wine, it was 80 per person? Uh, that's just that's spot on. <laughs> That is exactly right. Which, which, again, in the states, that it would be far more than that for yeah. this kind of similar kind of food. Yeah. Right? Well, you have to understand, uh, salaries in France are not that high. We can't. We just can't pay the kind of prices you pay in the U.S. We just. I mean, it's not not happening. So if they sure. if they want to have customers that are some French customers as well as visitors, they need to have you know reasonable prices. And it's, you know, if you live around here, you get to expect a certain type of service and a certain type of quality for a certain type of price point. And sure. so if they don't have stars, 80 sounds about right to me. It was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 we actually thought the value for the food at all of the restaurants we were at was, was yeah. quite reasonable. Yeah. Uh, but we did menu. We almost always did it, uh, the, the menu tasting. Uh, so, you know, uh, entree a plat and a... Maybe some cheese or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, or dessert or something. Yeah, very nice. All right. Yeah. So, so we were at Uzez for the market. Ah, which, yes. Which was really quite something. So we've been to lots of markets before on market day. And, you know, you expect to see, uh, you know, bread and pastries and maybe rotisserie chickens and... Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. But the, uh, the market, the Saturday market at Place aux Herbes was... They had everything. Right, there they was... have clothes, they have uh, right. yes. utensils, they have... <laughs> Pottery. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Tablecloths. Um, and it, we, it, it started at around 9.30 in the morning, I think. And there was just a few people there. By, by 11 o'clock, you could not even walk there. It was <laughs> quite crowded. But it was yeah, the place to yeah, yeah. No, I've been to that market actually. I don't know if I was there on a Saturday morning, but it looked like a lovely, lovely Provençal market. Uh, and it takes up a lot of room. It did. It does. <laughs> it spread and spread and spread. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the vegetables and the fruits were just gorgeous. Um, <laughs> I, I've just not seen anything like it. It was amazing. And in Kansas, we live in a, you know, a, a farming state. So All right, uh, you're used to good vegetables. Uh, we are, but the, 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 there was, it was beautiful uh, at that market. So. Pales in comparison. Mm -hmm. Sure. Huh. Wow. Well, French people are a bit, you know, they, they really love their fruits and vegetables. I think we, uh, I think we eat more fruits and vegetables than Americans overall, you know. I would agree. Oh, um, I would agree. I think yeah. that's true. Yeah. So that's lovely. That's lovely. You see, you have a list of tips. I want you to get to your tips because they look good to me. Okay. Well, I'll move this a little closer so we can both see it here. Um, the first one is about renting a car. Yeah. Renting a car in France is... It, it, or it, anywhere. Anywhere. It, I don't think it's any different in the United States. But it. So we, it, from a timing standpoint, it takes about an hour, unless you can somehow get some sort of priority. Uh, it's going to take that long. You know, planes land and everybody's rolling out to get a car at the same time. And if you are um, thinking about a restaurant that you want to eat at from 12 to 2 when they're open. We landed in Marseille at, at noon, so we were in a hurry to get our car to get. We already had a restaurant in in mind that was very close to the airport. Okay. Uh, that would have. But when we got there at one thirty, um, but it took us an hour to get the car, and that need uh, that's something to think about. Yeah. Uh, just to factor in that time. Yeah. And if there's a, a way that you can have, this sounds very American of me. <laughs> if you can have like a preferred status with that car company that would kind of expedite your pickup yeah uh, that that if it's an option um it would kind of speed things up for you yeah. i mean i realized we were on a certain timeline so it was they're, they're not super fast it's true they're not super fast yeah like americans are used to two things that 
don't happen very much in France, which is uh, service is fast and standardized and th- th- that they're open all the time, pretty much. Right. You won't, right. you don't get that in France. I mean, you know, yeah, we, I mean, it's hearts, it's the same company, but they haven't had the same pressure by their manager to get you out the door in three minutes. <laughs> you know, they, right. nobody cares here. It's like, I'm and, on vacation. <laughs> right. And and we, you know, that was the first part of our trip and we just hadn't got our mindset to we're on vacation. Yet, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. If you want efficient, then France is not always the best. <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> yeah. So after we went rented a car, one of the things that was very helpful was the, your podcast on kind of the driving rules. Uh-huh. Uh, in- that's a great one to listen to for anybody who's going to be driving in France. Yeah, I, don't, I think that was episode 16 or something. And it's mostly my husband who was dogging, doing the talking. Mm-hmm. Right, but right. It, but it, it was very helpful. There's a lot of those rules that I've had in my head uh, as we we're driving around. Yeah, and just being familiar with um, some of the signs, uh, what the speed limits are like in the towns. Yeah. Um, and just know that if you are renting a car, you're probably going to have a manual transmission. And those are... We all learned on manual transmission when we were younger, but uh, they're yeah. just not common anymore. So nobody's been driving a manual for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a little practice. I only killed it twice. It was pretty good. Oh, that's good. I, I, <laughs> I kill cars. You know, if if it's a car I haven't driven before, I, sometimes I stall the engine. It, it can happen. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. One other thing I think it's uh, if, if you have a car, uh, the parking tickets are very uh, – garages are very different in France than they are in the United States. In the United, in the United States, you almost always pay as you exit the lot. So you drive up to the gate and then you pay. Yeah. But in, in France, you go to a kiosk and you get a ticket. You pay and you get a ticket and then you use that ticket to exit uh, the garage. Um yeah. So okay, yeah. It would it'd be it'd be important to know that so that you didn't go up to the gate and then somebody was behind you and then Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good point. Good point. Which we've had happen on our first trip to France. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> learn by experience, but um let's see more about GPS and driving directions. Uh Philip and Jude gave us driving directions to their um the La Madeleine. To the La Madeleine. Um if they give you directions, please use those directions. Don't trust your GPS. I, you know, you could be driving <laughs> could be driving through a farm road or... Mm-hmm. We used our directions, um, <laughs> uh, but the uh, other couple ended up driving. They, they got a little bit lost. Yeah. 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 And, and the other thing that the GPS will sometimes do is to they'll give you the shortest route. Yeah. Well, that may be through... For, well, our, our example is that would have been through vaison la romaine the old town. Yeah. Now, that's a very old medieval city, and there's no way I would want to drive through that. Yeah. Uh, but the GPS was going to tell us to do that. Right. So if you're driving, especially in Provence, I have found, because Provence, the the price of the land has been high for long enough that the houses in Provence are really tight together, I think. Even, even like new construction, they just pack them in closer than in the southwest, for example. And mm-hmm. so it, you really, uh, if your GPS tells you to go, I don't know, take a left into something that looks way too small do not do it just keep going straight it will recalculate (laughs) because it's probably trying to save you a hundred meters by taking you through this really narrow you know don't yeah use your brains as well we we, we, and we rented the smallest car we could get Uh uh-huh yeah just because we 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 don't have a we we only have one bag uh, each and we you know it's easier to park and easier to maneuver. So. Yeah, yeah. This this conversation came up in the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook recently. Somebody says, "What if they should we get an SUV?" And several people said, "No, no, we got upgraded for free, and it was a bad decision because especially again, especially in Provence. Provence is Hello? tight. Yes, oh. I got gotcha. you. Okay, good. Yeah." <laughs> Okay, yes. Yeah. So I was okay. saying, I was saying that especially if you're going to be driving in Provence, you really need to not have a huge car. Right. No, small car is the, definitely the way to do it. Yeah. Um, we did see SUVs for people who had families and kids and car seats and things like that. Um, you could get, you could get all sizes of cars. Sure. But go with something small if you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So one one other thing that um, I would do when I would so the generally the most uh, economical way to obtain euro is just at a cash machine. Um, but it's a lot of times you get 50 euro bills, which are hard to use sometimes. And so I would always withdraw like 190 euro or 140 euro so that we would get smaller bills with that just yeah. as enough. Good point. And you, you discussed that in your, um, I think it was when people hate Paris episode. Yeah. Talking about the, the smaller bills. Yeah. I don't and, show and up how to with, do that. Yeah. I don't show up with hundred euro bills. They won't right. like and it. It's, you can also uh, break, uh, at least a 20 at the toll booth. Sure. Oh yeah. They don't take, they don't take fifties, but they take twenties uh, and you can get a lot of coins that way. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, a tiny word about public toilets. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't carry a purse in France, uh, but it might be nice to have a small bag and maybe carry some tissues and hand sanitizer. Yeah. Some of the older villages have pretty primitive looking toilets and when the urge hits you um, you want to be prepared yeah. so yeah that's and, all I have and to you say. know who those are for those public toilets in villages no they're for cyclists oh that's who uses those all the time and uh, so that makes complete sense yes so those <laughs> i cycle village... quite a bit that makes complete sense yep so those almost every village in france will have a public toilet area for men mostly because it's mostly men who cycle and mostly men who don't really care if it's you know, like, <laughs> right yeah right. so voila so that's what it is there you go <laughs> <laughs> uh our our main tip i think this is probably our most important mantra is to pack light ah yes uh, we do not check bags if uh -huh. we took a three-week trip, we would still just carry on. Um, with so, one bag. With one bag each. Um, you but, don't then need you, a, but then you, you can't take wine back. Well, that's true, but um, it can be shipped back. True. Um, and and Philip at La Madeleine will ship back uh, for you. He arranges that. So if you're staying there, um, consider that if it's the right time of year for That's shipping. That's good because it's really not very easy to ship wine to the U.S. It depends on the state. You have to fill out all sure, different it papers. Does. It's complicated. Absolutely. So if you find somebody who knows how to do it, do it. Right. And and he will take into consideration what the weather is like there, what the weather is like here. And if it's too hot to ship here, he'll hold it for you until it's OK to ship. And wow. um, so so uh, we we don't usually ship carry wine back with us. We just um, either buy it and drink it all while we're there or um, yeah. have it shipped back. But um, we when we are packing, we um, use packing cubes. We plan our wardrobes months in advance. We check the weather ahead of time uh, so that we can <laughs> pack as lightly as possible. And it's worked. Mm -hmm. That's it's worked. great. And, and you, typically in France, if you have a couple of layers and a raincoat, you're going to exactly. be okay. And that's exactly what we had. So. Yeah. Yep. Right, right. One thing about the airport security that's different uh, is that anything with a cord comes out. In the United States, it's not like that. But if you got a. I had a kind of bad experience, not bad experience, but a frustrating experience in Madrid um, that I. So I don't usually carry a lot of stuff with me, but I had my phone cords and my iPad, and I left all that in my bag. Well, I went through security three times before I figured out that everything that had a plug or would plug into something had to come out of my bag. Huh. So. Um, I finally figured it out after three times, but um, <laughs> <laughs> my Spanish annoying. isn't very good, so it, it took me a little bit of trying there. But um, it's also nice if when you are going through security, if you kind of compartmentalize your bag a little bit. So put all of that stuff together, maybe in yeah. a Ziploc bag. Yeah, yeah so, so you can that bring you can it just out. Just pull it out yeah, yeah, yeah. and put it back in. And then you can kind of reorganize your bag once you get through security. Good so. point. Um, another thing to note, uh, when you're staying in city center, um, it's the older part of the city, the buildings are old, the rooms are smaller and that's okay. Yeah. Just 
it's not going to be the Marriott with, you know, a thousand no. square foot room. No. Thankfully, it's not the Marriott. Thankfully, it's not the Marriott. <laughs> it's, it's in France and it's in city center. So Yeah, we don't right. have, uh, well, we might have Marriott's in France, but not, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not large rooms with a sitting room and all of that, unless you're paying fortunes. But right. typically hotel rooms in city centers are, you know, tight. Yeah. Which is fine because you're usually just out exploring the city. You're not in your room much. Right. So. so you can go out and then enjoy the cafes and the restaurants and the lights and all of that and come back to your room having had a little bit of wine and, you know, no harm, no foul. Whereas if you have to right. get in your car and drive somewhere because you want it to be cheap and you got a hotel, you know, 10 miles from the city, right. well, then, yeah, that's what you got to do. But I don't recommend it. Right. Very good. Anything else, Scott? Do you want to talk about the next couple of things? Um, so one thing that we, we always find are hotels uh, – ahead of time. So there's a lot of websites to look for those. Um, Bookings is one that has a lot of uh, European uh, penetration. It seems like there's a, there's a, uh, there's, it seems like there's just more uh, uh, hotels listed on there than perhaps TripAdvisor. But if I find a hotel, I always try and book it directly through the hotel website. Sure. Uh, oftentimes you can do the, the, the bookings will say they won't have any uh, rooms available, but if you go to the website, they'll, they'll find that um, there, are, there are rooms. And in fact, where we stayed in Uza is at Hotel Entregue, which was a lovely, lovely hotel, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that we were able to book directly through the website. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this despite is... The fact this that it this is... Full me, sorry. Despite the fact that it was listed as uh, uh, booked uh, in no rooms available on the other websites. Right. That's because uh, hotels... So if you own a hotel, if you want to list it you will pay a, a, a good chunk of money to the to booking or TripAdvisor or, or whoever is listing it. And so they don't want to have too many rooms uh, sold that way. They just limit the number of rooms. And so if, you, if they say they're full, they're probably not full. You have to call them or go to their website and find uh, the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have one regret... Ah. And that is that uh, we, on our last day, we were driving uh, to the uh, from Nîmes to the um, uh, Marseille airport, and we didn't have anything planned. And uh, Geraldine had suggested we go to uh, uh, Beau de Provence to see Carrier de Lumière, oh. uh, which we did not do, and we should have. When yeah. we got home and saw what it was and how cool it was, <laughs> yeah. we really kicking ourselves that we did not go to that because uh, it looks agreed, fantastic. Agreed, agreed. So Beau de Provence is not too far from Nîmes and Uzès and all of that. It's It's got, outside of Beau de Provence, you have this old, um, it was a quarry. Right, a, right. And a white stone quarry. And so it was cut up to extract stone, but you're in this quarry cave kind of thing and mm -hmm. they project marvelous shows onto all the wall surfaces all around you and the music is fabulous and I have been three times by now every time I'm anywhere near there I have to go I love yeah. the stuff even if I've seen the show I go again sure. <laughs> because it's so it's so meditative and Lovely to see the art moving around on the walls like this, and the, and the the sound is really good too. It's fabulous. So yes, you you, you made a mistake. You should have stopped. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> and right now there's a uh, Van Gogh. Yeah, uh, right. Um, and, and and they do this, they do this in Paris as well, but in Paris it's not in a quarry, <laughs> it's in a room with mirrors. Oh. Uh, which is fine too, but if you can do it in Provence, a million times better. It's just perfect, perfect, perfect. And you get the cicadas when you walk out. Oh, it's lovely. Neat. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah. And as I think about it, there actually was one other tip, and that is that uh, when we went to Pont de Garde, we had uh, bought our tickets online ahead of time. It's a little bit less expensive, not much. But when you get there, um, you get a parking ticket. And you still must go to the ticket office to get a new parking ticket to get out of the parking lot. Oh, 
Yeah, I don't remember how it works because, again, hmm, I have relatives nearby. So whenever I go, I use their car because they oh. have a sticker. <laughs> they can go in for free for oh. their sticker. And so I just... I, lo I borrow their car and I can go in and out with their, <laughs> yeah, so I haven't had to mess with that. <laughs> but it's not very expensive, I don't think. Like it's a, it, it is yeah, not. It's so. not. That, that's a great, every, that's also one of those things, if you're close, probably you should stop you should by. see it, yeah. And go early. It so, gets busy. So in this trip, is there anything you did not like and you wouldn't do again? I don't think so. We had a great trip. We planned enough time in each city and enough things to do in each city that I think um, it was probably our most balanced trip we've ever had in France. Mm -hmm. We That's were each placed the right amount of time. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And again, your, your guest notes will show all the details of how long you, you stayed and where you stayed and all of that. So, right. so that's right. very, that's very helpful for other people who uh, no doubt will want to follow your good example and, and <laughs> you're, you're making their life easy. You're, you already planned it. There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But uh, other than missing that show, um, it, it, the boat of Provence, I, I think everything else went, uh, Really swimmingly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we had planned to see uh, the Duchy in Uzez, but the Duke was there, so we didn't get to do that. But ah. we found other things to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it yeah. was fine. Yeah. Yeah. When the Duke is in the house, you can't visit. Right. That's how it goes. <laughs> and it is, it is the home of the Aribo Museum. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, Aribo Museum. Yes, of course. And I, I love that place. Love that place. Uh, so we, yeah. we 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 got some we got some gummy bears to take home. Oh, that's good. So did you go through the museum or did you just go to buy the stuff? We just went to buy the stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Our kids are old, older. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're all in college and high school. So yeah, <laughs> and they didn't come with you anyway. And they didn't come anyway. So right. all they wanted was the gummy bears. So that's all. <laughs> Awesome. And and when you go, you should buy candy because the way the flavors of candy in France is a little different than what they sell in the U.S. So it's the same mm. brand. It's Haribo, but it tastes better, especially the strawberries. I don't oh. know what it is with these strawberries that they make in France. Mm, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> they're terrible for you, though. Don't eat them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You guys, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing the, your wonderful experience in France. I'm sure that's going to be helpful to a lot of people. Your photos are also fabulous. So you thank were you. very easy to work with. You sent me all the photos, all the outline. Awesome. And you can speak French. Thank you. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you, Helen Rowe Tours. Tours? Toes. No, twos? I'm not sure, Helen. I apologize. Being French, sometimes I don't know these words. <laughs> Elizabeth Saxon, Rachel Waters, and Susan Burris for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. And thank you to Susan Schatmeyer for your one-time donation through the Tip Your Guide button on Join Us in France. And my thanks to all the other patrons and donors who support the show month after month. Thank you for giving back. Patrons and donors get a perk for their support. They get invited to a secret Facebook group where we discuss their plans and exchange ideas. This is a much, much smaller group than the closed group, and it is for people who not only listen to the podcast, but also support the podcast. Visit patreon.com forward slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes to join the secret group and also see the other reward tiers. A $20 donation using the green button on any page on joinusinfrance.com that says tip your guide will also get you an invite to this secret group. Today I want to thank those of you who report problems when they see them either on joinusinfrance.com or on the Facebook group. The PayPal button was acting strange. Susan emailed me about it. We had a couple of back and forth, but I think we've made it even better now because you can see both my name and the lo logo of the show. And I am grateful for folks who report inappropriate posts in the Join Us in France close group. 
the last one was some sort of credit card offer. Hey, people, please. Uh, <laughs> I would have seen it eventually, but you know, when I get up in the morning, there's been several hours of activity in the group because when I'm asleep is when North America is most active on Facebook. And sometimes my eyes are not quite lined up right first thing in the morning before I've had my few cups of coffee. <laughs> So thank you for reporting those things. It makes it much easier for me to take action. The other thing that's totally not okay is folks who join the group just so they can promote their services. They usually say something like, I can help you with that. Private message me if you're interested. A recent one was someone who was looking for couples who want to renew their vows in Paris. There are folks who want to find renters for their apartments or give wine tours or what. Ever. Please report those comments. It's not that I'm not interested in talking to people about the services they offer. I've had tour guides on the podcast and I'm happy to talk about their services. I don't even charge them a penny for it. But I want them to come on the podcast first. Uh, same for folks who want to promote a blog of theirs. I'm fine with that once they've been on the podcast with me and shared some good information with you on an episode. The GPS Aware Tour is moving along nicely. It has been approved after editing, and then I realized that it has to be tested on site. I don't live in Paris, so I wondered if I, have, if I would have to make a trip to Paris just to test the tour. But my friend Patricia to the rescue! <laughs> She's going to test the tour for us with a robo voice, no less, poor thing. But once we know everything works technically with the tour, I'll record it and it will be live for you to enjoy very soon. What's happening in my personal life? Well, you know, same old, same old, but um, I'd be taking a few vacation days in August uh, this year, so... July, I keep working. Uh, and I'll probably skip some episodes in August, but I haven't decided which ones yet, so I'll let you know soon. My daughter is going to be moving out to get her own apartment. She's about to start on her computer science master's degree. She's 21, so, you know, it was time. She got a cute little studio apartment downtown in Toulouse, and um, I was surprised that one of the things she said she liked about the apartment is that it has a washing machine. Who knew she was willing to use a washing machine? We've had one all these years, and she never, ever tried it. <laughs> But I can't complain. She's a great kid. I'll miss having her around every night. And she's not going very far, so we'll see a lot of her. Now I'll just go more gaga over the dogs. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> the other thing that's new in my life is that... Okay, this is weird, but I swear I, I have to talk to you about this because I'm excited. I got an air fryer. Everybody was talking about those things, and I like cooking. I was really curious to try it. I wasn't convinced that I like I would like it. I I even planned, okay, I'm going to get this thing. It's going to take up room on my small counter. We have a little French kitchen, you know. Um where am I going to put this thing? I f I decided that if I didn't like it, I would put it in a, a, one specific spot. But then I love that thing. I use it every day. Um I don't really know why they call it an air fryer because it's really a small convection oven. But then when it's just the two of us, it's perfect. You know, it goes up in temperature quickly. It doesn't heat up my whole kitchen. It cooks fast. It's great. I love it. So if you have great fryer recipes, please share them with me on the Facebook group. I know we're not a cooking group, but, you know, travelers, they do eat. If you want to recommend the podcast to someone who already listens to podcasts, tell them they will find the Join Us in France travel podcast anywhere they get their podcasts. They just have to search for it. If they listen to music but not podcasts on their phones, tell them to search. Again, search hmm. <laughs> for Join Us in France on Spotify or Pandora. And if they don't normally listen to anything on their phones, send them to joinusinfrance.com. And thank you so much for listening and for spreading the word. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Have a great week of trip planning or have a great week in France. And I will talk to you next Sunday. Au revoir. 
The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2019 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>